building pipes are, the same needles and syringes, but they create a key opportunity for us to engage with people. We've seen that hepatitis C can definitely be transmitted from people's lips onto the crack pipes, but you can't yet see whether that then transmits on, but we can make some assumptions that that might well be happening. So there is a clear hep C prevention benefit, but I think there's also this very important connection that it creates, which you just so well explained in terms of the work in Portugal. It's also really nice to set this session in the context of the, the local place that we are working. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our um, second, our third speaker, which is Vanessa Cortez. Vanessa is going to talk to us about smokable canes in Latin America and the Caribbean, and exploratory and comparative approach. Um, oh, sorry, could you not talk during the session? You picked up on the microphone. Um, so. Um, Vanessa is a social anthropologist with a master's degree on mental health. He is a professor at the University of Costa Rica. He is executive director of the Costa Rican Association of Drug Studies, a member of the Latin American Network of People Who Use Drugs, and a researcher at the Collective of Drugs and the Law. Drew, how did you go? That's how I'm really interested in what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's also my first from a dozen to that So, uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going to present uh, work we've been trying to to finish in the last couple of years with the Transnational Institute. It's been a long work. We have uh, built a group of specialists, of harm reductionists that work all around Latin America to try to gather some information about smokable cocaine. And uh, I have a problem with the presentation, I'm going to skip a couple and then go back. I didn't realize it could flip a little. So I'm going to try to go fast. There's a lot of information. We're finishing this report, so it's the first time also we're going to present this kind of data. It's mostly qualitative, but also a little bit of quantitative data. So the first thing I wanted to show is another map. It's the lack of research that we have in Latin America on smokable cocaine. There's no comprehensive research, and that's what I put the COCA uh, cocaine project that the WHO and UNODC did like 20, 30 years ago and was never published. So there's a small resume going around that you cannot use on site because it's not published at all. So, well, that's not, that's something you see usually with you know, UN agencies that work on drug policy. So it's not uh, hard. Like to understand what's happening there. But at the end, we can find some information produced by CCAT, that is the OAS, Agency on Drugs, and a lot of research done in Brazil and Uruguay, that are the only two countries that have developed continuous research. Mainly Brazil, they did a huge uh, uh, survey. The blue, the blue one, I have a point in here. I don't know. I just changed it. <laughs> no, it doesn't have a point. Okay, this one. All right, the blue one, it's a huge uh, survey they did in all Brazil to know how many crack users they had. So I recommend you to check it. It is the only country that has developed uh, research in this area. So the, the document has based on four areas. First one is the substance itself. When, what are we talking about when we say smokable cocaine? And why we use the word smokable cocaine? So the first thing I, I want to show you is a map where coke, coca leaves is produced, these three, these three countries. Um, in this area, and a little bit down maybe in Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, you could find base, coca base. And that's, that is the cocaine process, sorry, next one. The, the cocaine process, how it's produced. This is from a TNI document from 2006, you can look it around. It's a research done in South America, mainly Argentina, but it's, it, it, it could also change also because the substance has also been changed. So what you see, it's in this process in the right, how many varieties of cocaine could be smoked. Because at the end, the, the, the cocaine uh, hypochlorite cannot be smoked, but you can, but the effect won't be as strong as being a base. So at the end, what we have is mainly this taco, or this uh, uh, basuco, that it's called like uh, basuco basura de cocaína. It's the rubbish made from cocaine. So when it's left from the cocaine production, that could be smoked. But also the, the, the part before that, that you see also in Paco, it's the cocaine base, pasta base, that can also be smoked. 
And after you make the cocaine hydrochloride, you have crack when you mix it with ammonia or the sodium bicarbonate. So most in our countries that are not producers outside this and this area in the south, what we have is crack. Even though sometimes in the south you can hear about the pasta base. So the difference, you can see these photos, you can find many different pictures also. We acquired <coughs> pictures from different uh, specialists and it's hard to get a difference also. At the end, we see basuco or pasta base more of a haze, more dusty, and the crack is more well, uh, a rock. And that's why we call it piedra, or rock, in many other countries. That's a common name. This is a research or a published document by CCAT, the OES drug agency, on different countries that they made analysis of the, of the pasta base or the crack. They, they were in the streets. The thing is, you see many crosses here, I'm not going to explain methodology. But the point is, in Chile they analyzed like 300 samples. In Uruguay, I think there was like 200, but in Argentina it was like 20. So, the, the same research that comes out shows it's really contaminated, but it's not definite of all the contamination it has. And even in Colombia, they made, uh, they come in right now? Colombian friends that were part, that are part of the group, they made a research on, on Basuco industry. And they even found it had more cocaine than the cocaine that was sold in the street. So it also depends on the moment and how it's produced. And the, the point is we don't really know what's out there. At the end we say smokable cocaine because there's so many varieties that it's hot to, to get if it's crack, if it's before, if it's space, or if it's basu. The, the other steps, uh, that was done as well. just give me a second, this I have to jump this one. <coughs> All right. So it's how it's smoked, it's also it changes also from country to country. I even missed some pictures here because we have smoke it in a can that's really common for crack. You don't see that much for basuco or pasta or base. In, but you see this kind of pipes doing with pens and plastics and different kind of materials, really artisanal and crafty way of doing pipes, more for basuco. They also, the thing also if you see is how the, the fire puts directly a uh, paste has you have to put the fire directly when crack that is this show here sorry it's in Spanish but it's a, uh, a way to show how it's usually done but you see it's it's with a um, it's with a, not a glass pipe it's metal pipe that's really common in most of Central America and Mexico uh, people use this antenna car antennas or any kind of, of metal object. And well, for sure, that kind of brings some some problems that we're going to talk about when we, when we talk about paraphernalia. You know, Matt already said everything else. So when I went to the back, it's the market. The market's really different in every country. I'm showing here the two open herb markets in Brazil. In the bottom, Sao Paulo applies our venice and our is Cracolandia. It's crackland. That is in Sao Paulo, that you have like, uh, I don't know, 800,000 people in the street selling and using crack on a daily basis. And that was El Bronx in Bogota. I say was, because it's not anymore. It's already moved, and I'm showing you what, what happened. The thing here is, not every country also has open air crack markets. In fact, most of the countries have uh, crack, it's really sold in certain areas, really hidden population, uh, dark. Or, or marginalized communities. And that's the biggest point we found out. When we talk about users, uh, oh, sorry, uh, just to think about it back. Crack can be sold in any, any kind. It's, it's usually sold in small doses from less than a gram. The same with the paste. And it also depends on how far you are from the production countries and how, how um, expensive is the cocaine to produce crack, you will get different prices. But it may vary from half a dollar to a dollar. Well, at least in Costa Rica and also Central America, that is a common price for crack, also because cocaine is really cheap. So, what I wanted to show is uh, this open air market because it's also show how users are portrayed and how many of the users, even though not only uh, marginalized and vulnerable population that smokes uh, cocaine, uh, it's definitely most of the people we interview and we work, for, work, work with said there's middle class and high class uh, people that do smoke cocaine it's not common at all and you don't see them in the street so at the end most of the work we we got gathered from our 
network specialist. It's based on street work in uh, really poor neighborhoods. And I also showed that because in Bogota, in the Bronx, in 2015 or before, they made a big harm reduction program called TAMATS. And there were mobile units going around the city in different areas, giving support, different kind of support, with a really harm reduction perspective, a really progressive program. And the other one was the Brazos Abertos in Sao Paulo, that many of you have heard of, called, because it was also a huge program, one of the biggest, maybe I say the biggest one in Latin America. It's a really comprehensive program, and I'm going to go through that. Political changes. In 2016, the mayor of Bogota changed, and in 2017, the mayor of Sao Paulo changed. One of the first things they did was make a raid in the Bronx and Cracolandia, and both of these programs have already disappeared. So, even though we have evidence that these programs work, the governments don't change. They just shift from the left to the right. So now we have no more harm reductions, even though they had evaluation that it worked. So, this is what the programs focus on on the document reveal uh, crack, uh, uh, risk reduction. The Open Society Foundation has been pushing a lot to gather this information to push how what programs are doing. Brazos Abertos is just one of several programs developing in Brazil. Uh, uh, Rafaela talked about attitude that it's in the north. Corre por abrazo. There's several. Uh, Examples in Brazil is one of the best examples on harm reduction programs in Latin America. Taking into account this, these programs are not focused only in drug use, as you can see. It's a comprehensive harm reduction perspective that searches for people' um, well-being. So it has to be there, to be close to these people, to offer them housing, to offer them job opportunities. Uh, all of this with a harm reduction perspective and definitely networking, intersectorality to try to put the people in the, in the treatment um, process and never asking for abstinence. Um, this is some data that the, uh, I'm not going to go through that, but the Brazos Abertos made an evaluation and they evaluated like 800 of their, the people. Uh, and many of them had really good results after a year. A lot of them have already quit it, crap. So this, they put it out before the government changed, and even though they had an evaluation of the program, the program was, was good. Well, it's, it's still going there, but it less, has less and less resources. I also want to show we didn't find much paraphernalia or pipes for crack or pasta base. There are some things in, in Brazil, for example, the, the, the cachimbos, the pipes they use, are really long and the market, at least in Cracolandia, it's really hard just to go out giving out uh, pipes. There's, some, there's people selling drugs, there's organized crime, so you have to also be careful on what you bring out to the streets. So what they decided just to put out these tubes, it's a, a rubber tube for the mouthpiece, as I said, well, as Matt said, definitely we know the, the lips burning, it might be infection uh, risk for H, uh, hepatitis C infection. And also, a important thing is, is the mouth. Uh, a lot of, of the people we work for said, like, they also have uh, partners, they like to kiss each other and to have, like, lips. So the lip balm is also really important. At the end, it's a mouth uh, protection. In fact, the Kamats in Bogota, the, the dental hygiene was really important. It was one of the first things the, the crack users and pasta base users look for. There's also some experiments in Colombia with these materials that not burn, and you have you can put together all of the pieces because most of crack users and pasta base users like to scrub all the, the stuff that is in the in the pipe to smoke it again. So the thing with this pipe is also you can put it out together so you can scrub it easier. And this is a more like the well developed kit. This was a program in in Mexico City. It was during the year that they got resources from a university in, in Los Angeles, so they were carrying like this big kit. So for molecular substitution, there's nothing, uh, there's no, there's few research and mainly observational. Like we don't have a random control trial yet. I heard they're starting a random control trial and they've been developing mainly with cannabis. That is where we have found more evidence and more experience. Mainly in Brazil, there's two articles here, you can search them around in, on the internet. And in Jamaica, 
and also in Paraguay, that one of our specialists told about it. It definitely helps people with craving, with the uh, abstinence uh, symptoms and stuff. But it also helps them to be, still be part of a group that use illegal drugs. Again, you can still smoke in, in illegal substances, and it's not, uh, it could be.